Good afternoon. <clears throat> Welcome to 123rd episode of Creative Online Weekend Talks. Today's topic is on Atto Second uh, Science. I am Supriya Naika, your host for this program. Creative is not just a group, it's a community of like minded individuals with shared curiosity for acquiring new knowledge. The name itself holds significance cream for creativity and active for being active. In essence, creative emphasizes that to be active, we need to be create, creative. Our tagline, Knowledge Square, reflects our belief that the sharing of knowledge is catalyst for its growth. Our vision at Creative is to uh, construct, build constructive thinking across various domains. We focus on non-textual, non-academic, non-syllabus concept, pushing boundaries and exploring Un uncharted territories. Yeah, very Saturday, we come together for our online weekend talks on Zoom platform and we live stream the program on our YouTube channel, Creative GBD. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Vinay Majetti with us. Uh, he is currently working as uh, an uh, associate prof assistant professor, professor at the Department of Physics, IIT Tirupati. He works in the area of ultrafast physics. He, he has obtained his MSc in physics from the uh, Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning, Andhra Pradesh, and his PhD from uh, his PhD from uh, Lundbeck uh, Maxellian University, uh, Germany. Prior to joining IIT Tirupati, he also worked as a researcher at the Center for Free Electron Laser Science, Hamburg, uh, Germany. And uh, Sir will provide an overview of what a second science discussed current state uh, of the art techniques and explore the application that allows us to study and control electron dynamics in matter. Please join me in welcoming uh, today's speaker of, uh, of all and uh, welcome uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Vinay sir. And I welcome all the participants for today's session. Over to Vinay sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, can you just confirm that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a normal. Okay. Slide mode. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me onto this platform and talk to you all about um, what's called attosecond science. Uh, I should also thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Arvinda, who is associated with your uh, with your platform. And he introduced me to this very nice platform where you're really doing some nice work, familiarizing a lot of people with cutting edge science and technology. So uh, the context in which uh, I've been talking, giving you this talk is uh, the recent Nobel Prize that was awarded in physics. Uh, and this was awarded to three scientists, Professor Pierre Agustini, uh, Professor Ferenc Krause, and Professor Anne Hulier. And the Nobel Prize was uh, given for some path breaking results or breakthrough in the technology of what is called attosecond science. So the Nobel Prize citation states following. So the prize is awarded to these three scientists for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics and matter. And specifically, they highlight the contributions of these three scientists as follows. So Professor Annie Hulier, uh, she's from Sweden. Uh, she Her particular work that is cited is for the measurement of overtones that arose from the interaction of Nobel gas with IR laser. Uh, Professor Pierre Augustini for the generation of attosecond pulse train with each pulse of duration 250 attoseconds. And Professor Ferenc Krauss for generation of isolated attosecond pulse of duration 650 attoseconds. So what I will discuss today uh, is to give you... Uh, First of all, I will tell you what is attosecond 
attosecond is 10 to the minus 18 seconds. It's extremely small unit of time. What really happens in this attosecond time scales? I'll try to give you a bird's eye view of what is an attosecond and what really happens at these attosecond time scales, which is what makes it interesting to study. And if you want to study something that's happening at attosecond time scales, you also need flashes of light that are as short as attoseconds. And once you have extremely short flashes of light, it also becomes very difficult to measure them. Uh, what did these three scientists do in order to measure something as short as that? And what are the applications of these technologies that have come through due to the efforts of these scientists and also a number of other researchers working in this field across the world. Okay. So what is attosecond? Attosecond, as I just said, it's a very small amount of time that's 10 to the minus 18 seconds. So to give you a feeling for what a 10 to the minus 18 second is, I'm just going to follow again the Nobel Prize uh, citation talk. What it, it, it gives you this nice comparison. So if you look at the age of universe as of today, that's the best estimate as far as the advanced theoretical physics and experimental measurements we have is that the age of universe is about 13.77 billion years starting from the Big Bang. If we convert this 13.77 billion years into seconds, that's 10 to the 18 seconds approximately. Now, if we look at the heartbeat in a human being, we our heart beats about 70, 72 times per second. That's approximately one beat per second. So if we compare our heartbeat to the age of the universe, it's like one is to 10 to the 18. Now, if we look at what an attosecond is, it's the reverse of it. So if you were one second, that's the heartbeat, how it compares to the age of the universe is an attosecond compared to the, you know, the time it takes for one beat of the heart. What really happens in these attoseconds and what makes it interesting. It turns out that the motion of the electrons inside an atom, the valence electron motion happens on these attoseconds. Okay. So to give you a bird's eye view of the microscopic world. So if we start from it, the nature has really set down, uh, there are the length scales associated with the material system is really associated with the energy scales and the energy scales is related to the time scales of dynamics. So if we look at atoms in molecules and solids, so that means we're talking about, let's say a H2 molecule, there are two hydrogen atoms that form a H2 molecule and these hydrogens vibrate. Or if you take any solid system, there is a crystal and the atoms that constitute this crystal vibrate in a certain fashion. There is a certain length scale associated with these lattice structures or the size of the molecules. And this size, which is on the scale of, if you take a bond length, it's about something like an angstrom or a nanometer, that really decides what are the energy scales associated in this quantum system, which then decides what is the time scale. That's a picosecond. Now, if we go further smaller, if you look into an atom and look at the electrons and not the nuclei, it turns out that there is, these are even confined to smaller distances and which implies that the time scales are even smaller. So if you look at the dynamics of electrons in atoms or molecules, that's below a femtosecond. A femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds, a picosecond is 10 to the minus 12 seconds, and an attosecond is 10 to the minus 18 seconds. So there is a kind of a relation between the length scale to the energy scale, to the time scale. So atoms, the electrons and atoms and molecules move at this time scale. Now, what do we really mean by a motion of an electron? So this, on the left-hand side, there is this picture that a lot of you would have seen uh, in your high school textbooks and so on. That is this kind of a planetary model where there is a nucleus and then there is there are these electrons moving in an elliptic orbit. Although this is a nice picture, but it's really a wrong picture of the structure of the atom. So quantum mechanics, which has been very established now in the last 100 years, tells us that there is an uncertainty relation. You cannot really 
talk about the position and the momentum of the of an electron that means i cannot really define an orbit associated with electron so then what do i mean by really the motion of an electron in quantum mechanics the state of an electron is defined by a certain probability distribution and these probability distributions are you know known as orbitals so for example you take a hydrogen atom you can have an electron sitting in the 1s orbital which has a spherical probability distribution a 2s orbital which also has a spherical probability distribution and then you can have these kind of lobe shapes probability distributions for the 2p electrons so if i have probability distributions associated with the electron what do i really mean by the motion of an electron so i'll demonstrate this with a little example i think this is still quite accessible to probably bsc students who have done some quantum mechanics so the state of any system of an electron is described by a state psi and the probability of finding this particular electron at any position at a given time is given by psi square this is a postulate of this is the important interpretations of quantum mechanics and let's say i prepare the state of a system in a superposition of 1s and 2s states these states would evolve as per this simple rule that is that each of these states acquires a certain phase which is given by this exponential minus i energy t by h bar okay this is the state of the system at a later time and we know the formula for finding the probability distribution that is just compute psi square and i just evaluate here the psi square for this given psi of t and what we find is we have some this is just like your interference for example if i have a single slit uh, sorry a double slit young's double slit experiment i have two different waves that are interfering so these are two different wave functions and when i square them when i just sum over them and square them i get these two terms which do not have these two are not um interference terms but i have these cross terms which are the interference terms so i have this psi1 a star psi2 s times an exponential of i the difference between the energies of the two states t by h bar so this the real part of this function gives you a cosine function so this is your interference term and it's oscillating with time and the oscillation period the frequency is given by the difference between the energy of these two levels so if i work out the numbers i just give you the final number here if i prepare the state of a hydrogen atom in a superposition of 1s and 2s states and look at how does the probability distribution oscillates with time i get an interference term and that interference oscillates this term oscillates with a certain frequency whose corresponding time period is 350 attoseconds so this is what we mean by the motion of an electron so let's look at this a little bit pictorially Uh, so these are the probability distributions of the hydrogen atom in the 1s and 2s states and we prepared the state in this superposition and i just plot here the formula that's a probability distribution as a function of time so i just picked some random times and you see that the overall probability distribution is changing right so the green curve has maximum probability of finding the electron here where radius is equal to maybe one atomic unit and whereas with the blue line i see that the probability the maximum probability of finding the electron that is at a later time t is equal to 970 attoseconds is not at one atomic unit but it's at four atomic units so the same thing can be nicely visualized in this color plot that is whatever i have plotted here in this left side bottom plot is one cut across this horizontal so if i convert this height information into color information and make a plot of how does this probability distribution evolve with time so this y axis is time and the x axis is the position coordinate and the color information is in uh, the, the height information is encoded in the color so how do we read this off wherever if i look at this horizontally at this point this is where i have this green color which corresponds to the largest probability so you see this this blob kind of changes as a function of time at this particular time is equal to let's say 400 the maximum probability is at one atomic unit and at a later time the maximum probability is here that is at four atomic units 
So I see that the maximum probability of finding the electron oscillates. So this is what we actually mean by a motion of electron rigorously quantum mechanically. Now, why is this so interesting? If you look at any chemical bond formation, right? This is what governs all chemistry, biology, material science. This is all about individual atoms coming together and forming bonds. So what is the meaning of a bond being formed? So let's say I take the H2 molecule, the simplest molecule that physicists would like to play with. So I have the two electrons, one electron in the first hydrogen atom, the second electron in the second hydrogen atom. They're sitting in the 1s electron. That means their probability distributions are simply spherical. When they come together, the, the potentials behave in such a way that the minimum energy is for this kind of a configuration. That is, the probability density from here would a little bit from the left shifts to the middle and a little bit from the right shifts to the middle and it forms this kind of a sigma bond. Or let's say you look at the hydrogen fluoride. I have this hydrogen atom, this is spherical cloud. Then the fluoride, fluoride, fluorine, it has this 2p orbital which looks like this. Now there is a certain quantum dynamics happening. And there is a change in the overall electron density cloud and this forms a sigma bond. So it is really this kind of an electron motion that governs all the chemistry, biology and material science you know, on the entire world that we are looking around. Now, if this kind of motion of the electron that forms bonds happen at these attosecond time scales, although I just showed you a very simple example of uh, superposition of 1s and 2s states of the hydrogen atom. But if this is the kind of dynamics which happens at these attosecond time scales, which is what governs the entire world that is around us, all the properties of the materials, then it becomes extremely important to study these and see if I can actually follow these dynamics in time. That means I want to see this cloud moving from the left hydrogen atom to the fluorine atom. And that will definitely give us a lot of insight into the physics or chemistry of that particular system, as well as once we are able to see that as a movie, the insights provided will also let us control these chemical reactions. Now, what does it really require to make such movies of these electrons moving at these attosecond time scales? You know, all of us are now having smartphones. We are always taking short videos, movies, or pictures. If I want to take a movie of something, you know, some, some person moving or somebody dancing, what does it really mean? So if somebody is dancing and I need to take a movie of it, it means that I need to take a lot of pictures and then add them together in such a way that I can see this as a continuous movie. So if I were to make this statement a little bit more rigorous, if there is a certain time scale associated with the motion of that particular system where it could be a person shaking his hands. If he's going to move his hand in about a few seconds, then I need to take about 100 pictures within that second so that I can construct a smooth movie of that particular person you know, dancing or shaking his hands. So the same thing should happen at this microscopic world. If an electron probability density is changing in these attoseconds, I would need to shine this with flashes of light, which are shorter than that, so that I can take photographs and then put them all together to construct a movie. So what does this mean? Um, I need extremely short pulses of light, which are on attoseconds. Now, these three scientists that I have shown you at the beginning of the first slide, they have, these have contributed a lot into development of a technology of what is called an attosecond laser. This is a big sophisticated system that can actually generate pulses of light which are as short as a few hundred attoseconds. I think today's record is that, I think the shortest pulse that can be generated is about 60 attoseconds. So uh, let's go back to a little bit of basics. So what we need to make these movies is ultra short lasers. Okay? What is a laser? So the first laser was actually discovered in 1960 by Maiman. And it's based on this simple principle that is you take a material which is called an active medium and you pump it with some light or it could be an electric signal. So this particular material can be modeled as a three level system. Let's take the simplest possible level scheme. So the pump, this is a pump that you have lots of atoms. 
you pump all of them into this excited state and these are called the metastable states and after certain time they cannot remain in this excited state they de-excite now quantum mechanics is all about probabilities and not all of them would de-excite to this there could be other processes happening but there if you pick a particular system where there are significant number of atoms that would de-excite to this level that's on this right hand side they would emit some radiation that is at this frequency h bar corresponding to the energy h bar omega l now this de-excitation process is called the spontaneous emission that means it just emits without any external stimuli now this kind of a spontaneous emission is usually incoherent because each atom is emitting in different directions and they're also emitting with different phases now the way to make them coherent is to put this active medium between two mirrors and the spontaneously emitted photons would hit the mirror and bounce back. So when they bounce back, this emission can be stimulated by the photon that has bounced back. So this stimulated emission means that all the atoms slowly start emitting in the same direction and in the same phase and they all add up to become a strong light source. And that's why this particular setup is called a laser and that means that light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So when Wyman initially discovered this laser in 1960, uh, he called it a solution awaiting its problem. He really did not know, okay, I have a nice coherent source of light, but what do I use it for? Now, 60 years from now, it's essentially used everywhere, basically, in all possible fields that you can think of. Lasers are used in medical field, for, for example, eye surgeries, a number of surgeries. Uh, it's used in industry to do laser machining that you can use strong lasers to cut metals, to kind of make some artificial structures on metals. Uh, it's used for fundamental physics and chemistry also in terms of spectroscopy. It's used in data storage. That's for example, to read and write from disks. It's used in communication. Today we are able to have this Zoom call because we are all connected to nice broadband connection, which is through optical fibers and it's transmitting light. And it's also used for what's called sensing and metrology. For example, timekeeping. How do I define a um, second, right? In India, there's what's called the National Physical Laboratory, which keeps the time, which standardizes time. and the setup that standardizes the time also uses lasers. Okay? So it's basically there everywhere and you cannot think of a field that does not use lasers. Now, since the inception of building these lasers, there is always a quest, a constant quest to improve. I know I have built a certain technology I want to keep improving and make it more and more versatile. So the key areas are, can I make my laser stronger and stronger that means i want to make it more and more intense can i have wavelength tunability because i could have one particular active medium as i showed that level diagram a particular material would emit at a particular frequency you can build a laser at certain frequencies only can i do a lot of material science research uh, and so on and find new materials which can be used to build lasers with a wider wavelength durability tunability and also can i make these lasers to emit shorter and shorter pulses of light just in the beginning i have motivated you why would i need an attosecond light source you know, we can really revolutionize chemistry and biology if i'm able to take movies of electrons moving around in the microscopic world now this is kind of a time map of how this evolution has happened. In 1960, you had these continuous wave lasers and one could create really a 100 microsecond pulses by just having an optical chopper. It's like I put something and then take it out, a physical obstruction. So I have a laser and I can move something using electronics. I can obstruct it and then I can open the obstruction and this can create up to 100 microsecond pulses. And there were then important technological milestones. This is called the Q switching which reduced the pulse duration to 100 nanoseconds. And then about 70s, there was another major breakthrough, uh, which is called the mode locking. And during 1990s, um, or 
80s, end of 80s, there was what's called the chirped pulse amplification. So all these red dots are some very important milestones in the laser technology. And at this point, it turned out that compressing these pulses to these attosecond domain was really hard. And one needs some new physics or a very new regime to be explored. And again, this is where the three scientists' contribution has become very important, and that's why they deserve this Nobel Prize. So current state of the art is one can really produce attosecond pulses, and these attosecond pulses are not in the optical domain that are visible to our eyes, but they are in what are called the extreme ultraviolet and soft X-ray region. So this is broadly a bird's eye view of how this laser technology has evolved. So it really involves the following. One needs new material science. That means one needs to look at more and more uh, different materials that have nice optical properties that would be suitable for building lasers. And one uses the existing light sources, study the interaction of these new materials with existing light sources, and that can give rise to new light sources. So I have existing light sources, I have new materials, let these existing light sources interact with these new materials and see if they can emit new sources of light. Just like if I would remind you of the original first schematic, so let me go back. Um, so I had an existing pump source and we pumped a certain material. Let's say this is my new material. I pumped it and this gave me a new source of light, which is at a different frequency. So if I want to create new kinds of lasers, and part of it is we need, to, we need to really understand well light matter interaction. How do materials, could be gases, gas phase, liquid phase, could be solid state phase. How do these materials interact with existing light so that we can use this to generate new sources of light. So, so it really give you, a, now in the next few slides, I will give you again a very bird's eye view of how do you understand this light matter interaction for this I'm going to write a few equations but i guess it's accessible again to somebody who has done some electrodynamics course and have seen these uh, this equation which is you know the wave equation for the electromagnetic field in vacuum so the wave equation looks like this but if i am shining light instead of this light propagating in vacuum, if I shine this light in some me medium, so let's say it's a dielectric medium, then the propagation equation changes to the following. So what is this physically? The physical meaning is, if I let's take an example of an atom. So let's think of these two spheres as the positive charge cloud, which is more confined, and this blue circle is the electronic cloud. This is a neutral system. And now once you put a light field on it, now the light should polarize the system. That means it pulls the electrons in one direction and it pulls the proton in the other direction because they have opposite charges. Now this leads to this kind of a polarization and the nucleus or the proton being heavier, it moves less and the electron is more distorted because it has a smaller mass. So it could polarize the system in the following way. And if I have a oscillating electric field then the polarization also varies with time. For example, if at this peak of this driving field, the electron is pushed onto this direction. When the peak, uh, when, when it goes from a positive peak to the negative peak, the electron would move in the other direction. So what we have is essentially a time varying polarization of the system. And whenever we have a time varying polarization or time changing current, this is a source of radiation. So you impinge this light onto a dielectric material, the atoms inside the dielectric material get polarized and this polarization is time dependent and this time dependent polarization leads to radiation. So this polarization can then be expanded in terms of a Taylor series. So the polarization has to depend on the field because it's the field that is causing the polarization. And I can express this polarization in terms of a Taylor series in the field. And the usual linear optics that all of us study in the high school or in the beginning of the bachelors is where the polarization is just approximated to be proportional to this electric field. That means all these terms, these higher order terms are truncated. Just think of your Taylor series. It works very well if I can approximate this to be just the first few terms and the, and the mathematical 
meaning of this is the first term is more important than the second term and second term is more important than the third term and so on so these higher order terms are the contribution is smaller and smaller so therefore you can neglect them so the linear optics implies that you express a polarization as just this linear term and i can substitute for p in this wave equation and after a little bit of algebra it's not at all complicated just substitute this and rearrange this and then you realize that this c just becomes v and that v is nothing but c by n this is how you get the fact that the speed of an electromagnetic field in a dielectric medium is smaller and it is reduced by this refractive index and that refractive index is related to the susceptibility of the system now this is the usual linear optics and you look at this wave equation it just gives you back the same field it's just that in the dielectric medium it's just propagating slower but what if i have a strong field in which the higher order terms are also important so let us say i in increase my electric field that is creating this polarization in such a way that not just the first term but also the second term is important the e square term so let's just do a little bit of math e is some uh, sinusoidally oscillating field which can be written as the following and all that i need to do is take the square of this field if i take the square of the field immediately e to the i omega t square square gives me e to the 2 omega t and e to the minus i 2 omega t so whereas i have my driving field to be oscillating at this frequency omega the polarization starts oscillating at 2 omega and when i substitute this polarization into the field i start seeing that the electric field that is propagating in the medium not just has the omega frequency of the driving field but also the 2 omega frequency now you can play around with this if i have take the e cube term you can immediately guess that e to the i omega t cube will give me e to the i 3 omega t so this really opens up a very vibrant research field of what is called non linear optics i shine on a medium some light with frequency omega and if it has this chi 2 susceptibility then the light that is emitted out has the omega frequency and then has a 2 omega frequency similarly if i have a chi 3 field uh, susceptibility then if i shine i rate omega i would have omega and 3 omega so this is i'll just repeat what i said now i take a new material which has this interesting chi 3 susceptibility i shine existing light and this is a recipe for me to construct a new coherent source at 3 omega frequency that means i'm creating a new let's say a light source a coherent light source or a laser not just not at the omega frequency but at 3 omega frequency. now we know how taylor series behave in general a perturbative series behaves the higher the order of the process so let's go back to this equation the higher the order of the process the lesser is its weight so that means the chi 2 will be smaller than chi 1 and chi 3 will be smaller than chi 2 so the overall yield of 3 omega will be smaller than omega that is let's just take a small example just giving you some hand waving number if i throw 1000 photons at it maybe i will just get or let's say a 10000 photons at omega frequency i would only get maybe one photon of 3 omega whereas if i throw 10000 photons of omega here i might get 100 to omega photons so the probability of this conversion is smaller and smaller with the higher order nonlinear effects so higher the order the weaker is the process now this is what conventional nonlinear optics said and this is where this one of these pioneering experiments of annie hulier comes in so she and her group there are a number of other co-authors they were trying to measure these kind of harmonics being emitted from this xenon gas they were shining at this uh, neodymium yag laser with this kind of an intensity and they were measuring what is the relative intensity of the various harmonics you know the general conventional nonlinear optics knowledge tells us that you know the, the the yield as the higher harmonic order increases should really fall off whereas they have found that there is a certain regime in which a large number of harmonics starting from 5 to 19 they all have on the same scale you see there is an error bar here on this error bar scale all of them have almost the same yields and then suddenly they fall off this is what they call as a plateau region 
and this is where the new regime which leads us to the atosecond pulses starts so you, they found a certain very interesting regime where you can have all these higher order harmonics being emitted pretty much at the same intensity comparable intensities and this was a very uh, new result that needs an explanation and this is where um, the number of theoretical physicists and experimentalists came together and understood what is really happening so let's start with this right top corner this is a picture we had now if i keep shining stronger and stronger fields at this and you reach a certain field strength which becomes comparable to the coulomb binding strength so let's take the simple hydrogen atom there is a certain coulomb force that keeps the atom and the electron intact now if i have a weak field that is kind of perturbing it it creates this polarization and it's still the electron and the proton are bound but if you reach a very strong field where it becomes comparable to the binding strength itself then the electron is ripped apart so you see this in this picture that um, at the peak of the electric field this curve is a driving laser and this is the coulomb potential that's getting severely distorted because of the external electric field due to the laser and this leads to what is called a tunnel ionization process at this very strong field the electron is really ripped apart through what is called a tunneling mechanism and this electron becomes free and it undergoes a certain motion a free electron motion in the laser field and then there is a probability that this electron comes back and hits the atom again and when it hits the atom again i should remind you it's quantum mechanics there are a lot of things that can happen it could rescatter it could further ionize the system and so on but one of the important processes which has a uh, experimentally measurable yield is that it can recombine with the system now it has some additional energy that it has picked during the motion from the laser so the additional energy along with the ionization potential is emitted as what is the high harmonic photon energy so this is a schematic you see that there is a plateau region and you see that this process essentially leads to emission of all these harmonics and this has this characteristic feature the first few harmonics keep going down and there is a plateau region and then there is a cutoff now at this extreme fields the perturbative picture breaks down now this picture okay we just said okay this is what is happening there is some electron coming um, that's getting ionized it undergoes some dynamics and then recollides is this really true i'll show you a quantum mechanical simulation that we did uh, le let me explain the axis so this is a one dimensional quantum mechanical model so the x axis if i look at this slice along the x axis this is the wave function so the color tells me the probability of finding the wave function we did some masking to actually see the trajectory so what you see is at zero is my atom at certain regular intervals you see something an emission of a photoelectron you see this electron and then it's undergoing certain trajectory since it's now not a single electron but it's a probability distribution there is a probability that it would follow this or it would wait until a later time and get ionized and you see that there is, there are certain trajectories that actually come back to the zero for example this one it would come back to the zero which means it would recollect so that picture that is in this schematic is actually true and this is what is happening quantum mechanics now if you consider take these harmonics and just coherently add them up this is what happens so what i did here on the right hand side is i picked a few of these harmonics okay it looks a bit too colorful and maybe a little difficult to understand but all that i just did is i just plotted the different harmonics and at the bottom is the sum of all these harmonic fields you see that at certain time periods they would constructively add up and at a lot of other time periods they destructively add up so if i have a strict phase relation between all these harmonics and they coherently add up this leads to what is called an atosecond pulse trait the short electric field oscillation turns out to be in the atoseconds and if i have a many cycle driver uh, it leads to what is called an atosecond pulse strain and if i have a single cycle driver it leads to what's called an just a single isolated atosecond pulse so it's essentially that you have all these high harmonics adding up uh, coherently and this just leads to a simple 
addition a coherent sum of these electromagnetic fields giving you giving rise to this extremely short pulse now um, it turns out there is something very interesting about this uh, that although this there is a lot of quantum mechanical aspects involved in this whole model this three step model uh, uh, let me go back so this is also called the three step model the ionization acceleration and then recombination is there are a number of features in this harmonic spectra that can really be explained with just high school physics and that's also the beauty of this if i take this um this is my driving laser field it's some sinusoidally oscillating field and i know what is the force acting on the electron so so that means that i assume that there is this quantum mechanical tunneling and then the electron has been emitted and it's now free approximately free and this free electron undergoes some dynamics and the classical dynamics is just explained through when you put down the newton's equation so m rate of change of the position is equal to force force is charge times the field now we just pick some simple units it's called the atomic units to make the equation look simple and now you can just integrate this second order differential equation and you get just the equation for the position now uh, what i have here is at different emission times so that means i exactly do not know when the electron would get emitted for different emission times i just plot this equation which is very much accessible to high school students it's just integrating this twice and i get this equation for the position of the electron at later times and you see that you can find certain trajectories not really um coming back to zero and there are some trajectories that collide so now i know exactly from this classical trajectory for example uh, let's look at this black curve it has uh, been emitted at this point and then it again meets the zero axis this is a position axis this this blue is a position axis i just highlighted this the zero horizontal line to tell you where x is equal to zero is that means where the atom is it starts off at the zero position accelerates in the presence of the laser field and then again hits it back now how much energy has it acquired it's very easy to compute it's just half x dot square at the initial and at the final positions i just take the difference of the kinetic energies and this is what tells me what is the energy that the electron has acquired in the laser field and if i add this to the ionization potential and that is essentially the um, the energy of the photon that is being emitted and very interestingly this very simple picture can explain these important features in the harmonic spectra that is at what position do i have cut off at what position do i have planned to end so so this is a uh, really for um, the generation of the attosecond pulse uh, now it's not just enough to say that okay i have generated an attosecond pulse i need to really measure it you know, physics and all science uh, needs to really depend on measurements and physics specifically is as uh, as a science of measurements now how do i really measure something as short as an attosecond pulse no electronics really works because all electronics has response times of maybe microseconds or at best nanoseconds but if i have an electric field if i take a attosecond pulse and shine it at a photo detector it cannot really resolve this variation on attosecond time scales but it just gives me an integrated signal okay. therefore uh, in order to measure such ultra short pulses the technique that various researchers use is interference that is the tagline is use the pulse to measure itself so for example if i want to measure length i need a scale that is shorter than the length that i am measuring right <laughs> so if i have a pulse that is short i need to have some pulse something else that is shorter than that if i do not have that at best i need to use itself to measure itself right use the pulse to measure itself and uh, let me just check the time um, i think i have maybe 10 more 5 to 10 more minutes so what this is a simple michelson interferometer so there is a incident field uh, there is a delay line and you essentially split the pulse that is incident sorry this is the incident pulse this is the mirror on the second arm you have a delay line and what the detector sees is a product of e of t and e of t minus tau so initially let's say these two lenses are optical path lenses are same but have maybe a piezo or some translation stage 
where I can move this. And the detector essentially sees the product of E of t times E of t minus tau. Uh, and if I look at this averaged, the integrated signal, because the detector can still see just the integrated signal, if I square this up, there is this interference term, which um, maybe I just skip, uh, just mention that through convolution theorem, uh, it can give you the spectrum. So once you know the spectrum of the pulse, that is, and you can make an estimate for what is the temporal width. But it's not just enough to just know the width. You know, if, if I have to characterize any wave, I need to know the amplitude as well as phase, and that gives you the complete characterization. And in this case, people resort to, again, nonlinear optics. I'll just uh, skip for the, for the interest of time. But this is what people do for conventional ultrafast optics in the case of optical fields. Now, the problem with attosecond pulses, there are a few more problems, and that is these attosecond pulses are extremely weak. That means, you see, it's a highly nonlinear process. It is a high order process. We are looking at 13th harmonic, 15th harmonic, and so on. If I shine a million photons of the driving laser field, I would just get one photon at this XUV frequency. So there's a lot of research happening as to how do I increase the strength of these XUV pulses. But as of today, these XUV pulses are weak. So therefore, I cannot put it through a Michelson interferometer. And also, XUV optics is difficult. All the optics that we see in our you know, high school labs or PAC labs are designed for optical uh, frequencies and not for X-ray or extreme ultraviolet optics. There is a lot of uh, technology improvement that needs to be done there. So the way these pulses are measured is through photoionization. So let me just show you the essential principle. Uh, so this is the attosecond pulse train and there is a driving laser field. These two pulses are together used to ionize a certain system. Uh, so if I take a particular harmonic, let's call it 2m minus 1 and there is a nearby harmonic which is called 2m plus 1. Now when this ionizes the atom, it creates a photoelectron wave packet at certain energy given by this horizontal line. And with respect to this, when I ionize it with a higher frequency, because the photon energy is higher, so all of us know what is photoelectric effect. If I shine light on a medium that has energy that is higher than ionization potential, it emits a photoelectron whose energy is the energy of the photon minus ionization potential. So if I shine a higher energy photon, I would get a higher energy photoelectron. Now, if just with the attosecond pulse train, I would get these two photoelectron peaks or photoelectron emission wave packets. Now, along with this, if I also shine my driving infrared laser field, it can create this new pathway, what is called this first peak can undergo a continuum continuum transition. That is, this can emit an IR photon to create a wave packet here. And this wave packet can absorb an IR photon to create a wave packet. Now this becomes like an interference. So if you remember, just related to the young stubble slit experiment, I have a wave, I have two possible paths, I have two different path lengths, and when they both add up together because of the difference in the path length, this leads to interference fringes. Now think of this as an electron wave, electronic wave packet. Now I have two different paths to reach the same photoelectron energy. One is the absorption of this to a minus one photon and an IR photon. And the second path is to absorb this 2M plus one high harmonic photon and emit an IR photon. And these two paths give you exactly the same photoelectron energy. And this is like the same position on the detector. And when these two waves add up, it leads to an interference. Now on the right hand side, you see this kind of interference fringes uh, in energy. And these interference fringes can be used to extract the phases of the high harmonics. It is quite inward, but this is the general principle. So interference is the key to extract phases always. Now, uh, what are the applications? Really? I'll go through this a little bit quickly. So there are, I have broadly categorized these applications into the following. The first one is, can we understand some really fundamental questions in physics? That is. All the photo emission and photoelectric effect is really very old. We have known this since the time of Einstein. Um, 
we always talk about what is the energy of the photoelectron wave packet but can we ask a question how much time does it really take to ionize a system how much time does it really take to ionize and create a photoelectron wave packet and this was one of the pioneering experiments performed in 2010 it's from the group of Ferenc Krauss one of the nobel laureates what their group did is they now use this attosecond light pulses and the various tools that they have developed to measure them and they take took neon gas and picked a certain regime in which you can photo ionize from 2s and 2p states now when they ionized this and made some measurements they found that the 2s electron and 2p electron reaches the detector with a time delay of 20 attoseconds okay it's really experimentally uh, really a uh, important milestone to be able to measure something as short as that first of all to measure something as short as 20 attosecond time delay on the second hand it really opened up and asked this fundamental question oh why do these two photoelectrons really come at different times now a lot of work has been done and using advanced scattering theory and quantum mechanics one can show that this particular time delay can be related to scattering processes and the important thing is it gives us a very important information about the quantum states that has not really been accessible much for the so far spectroscopy and that is a phase of certain matrix elements involved in quantum processes now the second application this is actually a very important motivation is can i measure the or can i measure or take a movie of an electron cloud that is moving in a molecule let's just stick to this picture in the center this is an experiment performed in 2015 and reported in uh, uh, yeah in science journal they took this molecule which is um, which has two carbon atoms one hydrogen and iodine and they induce certain electron dynamics in this using a laser and using this high harmonic spectroscopy basically by looking at the harmonics being emitted from the system they were able to reconstruct how does the electron cloud change so at zero femtosecond it was there was an electron density around the iodine atom and as time progressed the density has shifted to the carbon atoms and so on so they have shown in this experiment that indeed these um, technologies can be used to image these kind of dynamics now another path that people are um, really studying is can we use these lasers to control elect electronics that is can we control currents in various systems at what is called the petahertz rate if you look at all the current electronics it's limited to gigahertz rate for example all our laptops computers mobile phones if we look at the processor and look at what is the clock speed it's let's say 2 gigahertz or 3 gigahertz and that really tells you the processing speed how many uh, machine at the machine level how many operations can it perform per second maybe it's for say gigahertz it means it can perform 10 to the 9 electronic and the uh, really the assembly level operations per second now if i can control currents in various systems so let's say this is this is a particular metallic configuration and use these ultra fast laser fields to generate currents not at nanosecond time scales but at at a petahertz rate that means i have oscillation of the current not 10 to the 9 times per second but 10 to the 15 times per second then it's possible to really improve the computing speeds by a million times but this is a, at a very nascent stage but uh, there are groups working on checking whether i can use these ultra fast lasers to be able to first generate currents and control them at these petahertz rates and very recently um, scientists are also looking at the various non classical aspects of light but maybe i'll just skip i won't almost 4 o'clock okay so this is um, essentially what i wanted to say i give you a bird side view of um, what an attosecond is what happens at an attosecond uh, how attosecond laser pulses are generated and how they are measured and what can you really do once you get a control of these attosecond pulses and before i stop uh i just want to show this is a picture from a website of max planck institute of quantum optics in garching one of the leading labs in this attosecond field area this is how a typical uh, attosecond laser facility looks like it's quite complex it involves vacuum systems it involves electronics it involves optics 
and vibration free tables and a lot of them. Okay. Um, yeah, with this, I would like to conclude and thank you for this opportunity to interact with you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Raghavendran, sir. Any questions? Ravinder sir, if any questions, you can unmute and uh, you can ask the questions. Okay. Okay. I think uh, no questions. Sir, uh, how you are working uh, on this topic, sir? Uh, okay. Uh, so what we do is uh, theoretical simulations. Uh, so although I have mostly discussed about the generation of atomic impulses, so as I showed you, uh, the interaction, how do I look at the dynamics of the electrons using these ultra short pulses? There are a lot of unanswered questions. That is, how do the many electrons in a, let's say, take a molecule, there are a large number of electrons, and you can have a number of many body effects. So, what we are doing is uh, we are looking more closely at the light matter interaction problem, that is, at this intersection of many body physics and light matter interaction, and we simulate these processes and check. Um, uh, what kind of things one can see if you shine these antisecond light pulses at various molecules and atoms. So it's mostly theoretical modeling. And I agree with it. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think uh, no questions. Can we conclude, sir? Yes, I think uh, we can conclude. Uh, thank you, sir, for sharing your uh, expertise in uh, attosecond uh, science. Uh, really, it's an uh, um, uh, insight uh, session for us to know more about the uh, Nobel uh, winning topic. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, being with us. Uh, thank you, one and all, for joining with us. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, we have to thank uh, Arvind, sir, for... Uh, uh, <laughs> giving uh, resource 